Hello Calc 3 and welcome back to another video. In this video we will be covering the first half of section 12.2 on vectors. So I want to start off by differentiating between two types of quantities, scalar quantities and vector quantities. Scalar quantities are quantities that can be described with a single number, for example mass or length. Uh, for example, if I asked you for the mass of an object, you might respond by saying that the mass of the object is 8 kilograms. It required one number and then a unit of measurement. Or the distance between two objects might be 8 miles, one number and one unit of measurement. Vector quantities, on the other hand, are quantities that are described by a magnitude and a direction. You need both. Examples of vector quantities would be velocity, force, or the displacement of an object. So if I asked you the velocity of a car, you would have to tell me both the speed of the car as well as the direction of the motion of the car. We can represent vectors mathematically with directed line segments. So in the example that I have here, I have a vector sitting inside of the plane. We could represent a vector similarly in space with a directed line segment as well. When we draw a vector this way, the arrow is going to point in the direction of the vector or the action that's happening, and the length of the arrow is going to represent the magnitude of the action. Going down to the example below that, let's say that I have a curve which is graphed in the plane that represents the motion of a particle. So that's the curve I have, I have drawn in blue here. Then the velocity, the velocity vector of the particle at a particular point would look like the arrow that I have drawn in red at the two different points that I've specified on the curve. Uh, so the direction of the vector is going to be tangent to the curve and the length of the velocity vector would be determined by the speed of the particle. And just from looking at the curve alone, I don't know what the length of the vector is going to be. That will be something that we talk about in a later chapter though. So let's move on to our first definition here. So the vector represented by the line segment that goes from A to B, point A to point B, has initial point A and terminal point B and the length of the vector we're going to denote uh, by this vertical bar AB vertical bar, something like the absolute value of AB. And note that two vectors are equivalent if and only if they have the same direction and magnitude. So we can draw vectors at all kinds of different places on the plane or in space, um, but as long as two vectors have the same direction and magnitude, it doesn't matter where we locate them in space, they're still going to be equivalent. We can translate vectors all over space, um, and it's not going to change the identity of the vector. So in the text, vectors are represented by bold lowercase letters. Bold lowercase letters are not nice to write when you're just writing. So uh, when you're writing homework solutions, or when I write in here, I'm going to denote vectors uh, with a lowercase letter and then kind of a half arrow above it. That's standard notation. And we typically represent vectors in what is called standard position. So a vector can technically have an initial point and a terminal point at any place in the plane or in three-dimensional space. Um, but when a vector is in standard position, it means that we translate the vector so that the initial point of the vector is the origin. Now let's move on to our second definition. So if we have a vector V, in this case a three-dimensional vector, in standard position with the terminal point V1, V2, V3, then the component form of the vector v is written with this expression here. So we have left angle v1, v2, v3, and then a right angle bracket, uh, where v1, v2, and v3 are just the real numbers from the terminal point. 
And the definition for, a, for the component form of a two-dimensional vector is going to be analogous. In that case, we just get rid of this third component. And the values v sub 1, v sub 2, and v sub 3 are the components of the vector v. Now, if we have two points in the plane, which I'm going to call p sub 1 and p sub 2, then the vector that goes from p sub 1 to p sub 2 in standard position is given by this expression here. So to find the x component, or I should say the first component of the vector v, we're going to take the x component of the second point and subtract the x component of the first point. For the second component of the vector v, we're going to take the y component of the second point and subtract the y component of the first point. And then for the third component of v, we take the z component of the second point and subtract the z component of the first point. And now two vectors are equal if and only if their standard position vectors are identical. So I said previously that two vectors are, uh, are equal if and only if they have the same direction and magnitude. But if you add the additional condition that they both have to start at the origin, then this in fact means that their standard position vectors are exactly identical. Uh, and in some more mathy language right below there, it means that if we have we, if we have two vectors here represented in component form, then they're going to equal one another if and only if each of the components are equal to one another. Now let's move on to the third definition for the section. So the magnitude or the length of a vector v, and here I've written it in, co in component form already, is given by uh, the expression, the square root of the first component squared plus the second component squared plus the third component squared. And again, you can recognize um, that we denote the magnitude or the length of the vector with this absolute value sign. And this is equivalent to the distance from the initial point of our vector v to the terminal point of our vector v uh, using the distance formula that we developed in section 12.1. So let's move right on to an example of finding a vector between two points in space in particular. So let's say we have the point P which is given by negative 3, 4, and 1. And then we have the point Q given by negative 5, 2, and 2. And we want to find the vector between them in component form and then find the length of that vector. So to find the vector in uh, component form, we're going to take the x-coordinate of Q and subtract the x-coordinate of P and then take the y-coordinate of q and subtract the y-coordinate of p, and then take the z-coordinate of q and subtract the z-coordinate of p, and this will give us this expression here. So that would be our vector v in, uh, in component form. And now to find the length of the vector, we're going to take each of the components of v that's in the component form up above, and we're going to square them and then add them together and then ultimately take the square root where here we're just using the definition of the magnitude of a vector from above and in this case we end up with the square root of 9 which of course is equal to 3. So now that we've talked about some basic properties of vectors, let's move on to some vector operations. In this section, we're only going to talk about vector addition and then scalar multiplication of vectors. So note that a scalar is just some real number. It is not a vector. Uh, and let's move right into the definition of both of these operations. So if we have two vectors, which in this case I'm going to call u and v,
and they have uh, the component forms that are given here. And let's assume that K is some scalar. Then we get a new vector called the sum of the vector U and the vector V by adding the components. So we add component wise when we take the sum of two vectors. And if we want to multiply our vector U by the scalar K, that's defined by multiplying each of the components of U by the scalar K. So we add vectors component wise, and when multiplying by a scalar, we multiply each of the components by the scalar. And we can also think about the geometric interpretation of these definitions here. So if we have two vectors, again, I'm going to call them U and V, and we want to take the sum of those two vectors, you can look down here to get a geometric interpretation of what's going on. So we have our vector U in red, our vector V in purple, and the sum of these two vectors is going to be the vector that, um, that connects the initial point of the vector U to the terminal point of the vector V. In this case, the blue vector that I have drawn. And if we want to have a geometric interpretation of scaling our vector by a scalar, again, assume that we have uh, the vector U drawn in the plane here. Then if I scale the vector U by two, I'm going to get another vector that points in the same direction as U, but the magnitude is twice as big. If I was going to scale by negative two, then I would get a vector that's on the same line pointing in the exact opposite direction. And again, the magnitude of the new vector minus two times U is going to be twice as big as the magnitude of U. And it is, a, it is generally true that if you take a vector and you multiply by some scalar, then the magnitude of the scalar multiplied with that vector is going to be equal to the absolute value of the scalar multiplied by the original magnitude of your vector u. And I'm not going to prove it here. Uh, the book does offer a proof, but I would just encourage you to prove it for yourself. You can even pause the video for a second and prove that. It shouldn't be too tough. And finally, let's move on to our last definition for part one of section 12.2. Um, it's just going to be the difference between two vectors. So again, if we have a vector U and a vector V in space, then the difference of the vectors U and V is defined as follows. Um, it's actually just defined by taking the sum of two vectors um, where we rewrite minus V as plus negative V. And negative V we have already defined because it's um, multiplying V by the scalar minus one. And of course, we've already defined vector addition as well. So when we add U to negative V, we end up getting the following vector in component form. So we get uh, U1 minus V1 for our first component, U2 minus V2 for the second component, and then U3 minus V3 for the third component. So if you wanna remember how to subtract vectors from one another, all you really have to remember is that you are going to subtract component wise. So you take component one from the first vector and subtract component, two, component one from the second vector to get your first component and then so on for the second and third components. And then finally, uh, the last thing to say for this part one, uh, section 12.2, uh, there's just some properties of vector operations that are listed in the textbook. I listed them here, they're good things to know. So the first property just tells us that vector addition is commutative, the order doesn't matter.
Uh, the second property tells us that it's associative, and that's the property that I end up proving right below here. Uh, the book proves the first property, the commutativity of vector addition. Um, the third property is just says that the zero vector is the additive identity. The fourth property says that each vector has an additive inverse. Uh, and the fifth property, you multiply by zero and you get back the zero vector. Uh, and you can look through the rest of these properties if you want to. I feel like it's probably not a good idea for me to just go down through the different properties and list off what they are. And honestly, a bunch of the properties you're probably not going to think about uh, when you're doing general vector operations, but you can look at them if you want to. I do want to look at the proof of the associativity that I have uh, down here. Again, the book gives a proof of commutativity that you can look at. So to prove the associativity property of vector addition, we can start off with three vectors, u, v, and w, and say that we are summing u and v first, and then we're going to sum w later. Well, we can break u and v up into their component forms, which I have listed here. And then we can sum those two vectors together component-wise to get this vector u1 plus v1, u2 plus v2, and u3 plus v3. And then we still have our vector w1, w2, w3 off to the side there. And now we're going to add these two vectors together. So the first component would be u1 plus v1, the quantity, plus w1. The second component is u2 plus v2, the quantity, plus w2. And then the third component is going to be u3 plus v3, the quantity, plus w3. And this is really where the crucial step happens for the proof. Uh, so the reason that we can switch the parentheses from u1 plus v1 to v1 plus w1, and then likewise uh, with 2 and 3 for the other components, is because of the associativity of, the, of addition of real numbers. So we already know that the addition of real numbers is associative, and that allows us to uh, change the order of our addition component-wise inside of our vector here. And because we can do that, then we can split up our, uh, our vector again. And when we split up a second time, we do get the vector u plus the quantity, the vector v plus the vector w. So this is just one example where the property um, of a vector operation really just follows from properties of, um, of scalar operations that we're already aware of. So the, associ the associativity of vector addition follows from the associativity of scalar addition. Um, commutativity, likewise, as the book shows, will follow from the commutativity of scalar addition. And I haven't checked the other properties, but I assume the majority of them just follow from properties um, involving scalar multiplication and, uh, and scalar addition. All right, so that is the end of the material for this first part of section 12.2, and the second part of section 12.2 should be uploaded shortly.